<laughs> Good, morning. Good morning. Thank you. Scripture reading today is in Acts 9 through 31, and Acts 11, 22, and 24. <clears throat> then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened living in fear of the Lord, and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, increased their numbers. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas and Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God has done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. So be it. Hear me now? Am I on? Am I on? Am I on? Am I on? Okay. Can you hear me now, Fred? I am on, though. I am on? Okay. If not, I can get louder. Don't worry. And just to let you know, if you haven't heard yet, I bumped my head yesterday, and my head hurts. But my wife tells me I'm a drama queen, so I'm stopping there. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you that you are such a loving, awesome God, that you are patient and kind, long-suffering, Lord, that you grant mercy to those who do not deserve it, and you give grace upon grace upon grace, even to uh, sinners such as I, that you bring your rain down, you bring your comfort down. Lord, most of all, that you sent your Son down from heaven to live a life, to show us the way. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us and lived and gave up his life to show us the way, to redeem us back to you by his precious blood. Lord, may we bring praises to you. May we offer up our life to you as a living sacrifice, following in the footsteps of Jesus so that we can show the way to, to others. Open our hearts to hear your words. Pour your spirit out upon your people, Lord, and help us to be the kind of people that you have called us to be, children of the Most High. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I entitled this A Good Man. That was in that scripture you read t today, or Merle read today. What does that mean, though, a good man? And if you read your Bible reading this week, that might have sp spoke out to you. If you didn't read your Bible reading this week, you, you should have read your Bible reading this week, right? We've kind of picked back up in Acts where we had left off before. You should have re read Acts chapter 7 through 11. And to just give you a brief... Um, Overview there to, to catch you up again. You know, Jesus, when he left and ascended to heaven after three years of missionary work here on earth, said, Wait in Jerusalem till what I have promised comes, and then you will be my witnesses. And as you read through Acts, you see exactly that happening in the lives of people. You see the church unfolding. You see the power of God here on earth. You see the kingdom of heaven coming to God. You see God making His reconciliation to mankind and doing it through Jesus' hands and feet, which is the church, which is you and I. You see the Spirit giving gifts to people as the Spirit um, determines to give gifts so that the body can be built up and edified. That's the plan as you're reading. And you see it come to fru fruition in the church despite persecution. How is the church doing today? How are you and I doing? So the author of Acts is Luke. If you don't know that, it's not entitled, but it says later on in it that it's Luke, who was a faithful companion of Paul to the very end, probably written in Rome, probably around the time that Peter wrote his letters to the churches. Peter and Paul probably are both in Rome, and they're probably going to be soon martyred, and Luke is writing this account. And he writes it to Theopolis, or Theophilus, however you want to pronounce it. 
Acts chapter 1 starts this way, in my former book. So we know we've got Luke's gospel there. We know we've got the, the book there. Theophilus, I write about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. I could preach on that for hours. I'm not going to. But I could. There's so much there. Former book, we've got Luke, so we need to look at his account of the gospel. We need to study the other gospels as we do, as we read Luke's, and see the good news that's there and compare the gospels and, and see this information about Jesus, the Word that was made flesh and dwelling among us, this fulfillment of years and years of prophecy, the promise that God had made to His people that had come true in the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus, the One who is the King of kings and Lord of lords that we might have thought would come down and reign and make everything kumbaya for us, but He came to die, to be the suffering servant. And He called us to follow Him. If you're willing to give up the things of this world, to follow Him. If you're willing to love as Jesus loved, and no greater love does a man have but to give up his life to save his friends. The light and momentary sufferings that you're going to face in this world mean nothing compared to your future glory. And there's no temptation that has come to you that God will not let you be able to withstand. You, in fact, are a child of God, given God to dwell inside of you. You are a priesthood, a royal temple. And I could go on and on and on. Do you understand from last week how blessed you are? Do you understand your mission and your calling? So Luke is writing this when everything seems gloomy and dark. Paul, or, Paul is going to be martyred. Peter's going to be martyred. What is the church going to do? Is it going to fall apart? Well, we've seen in Acts already the church doesn't fall apart because the church is a living, breathing organism of Jesus Christ Himself with Him as the head. It's not going to fall apart, but he writes this account that we still have today. In my former book, Theophilus. Who is Theophilus? We don't know. You know what his name means? It means friend of God. Might not even be a particular person. It might be Christians in general. Friends of God. You and I, if you've been blessed, if you're part of the kingdom, if you have truly been saved and set right with God, then you are not an enemy of God anymore. You are his friend. I wrote about all the things that Jesus began. That means that it's going to be continued. If Jesus began these things, He wants them to be continued until He returns again. And He does this work through us, the power of the Holy Spirit living through us. We are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. All the things that Jesus began to do and teach. So two things we're supposed to do here. Do good works and teach others as they see our good works that glorify our Father in heaven. And we're given the opportunity to preach the gospel message. Because if we're not doing these things, we're not going to get the opportunity in the first place. And if we do get the opportunity, the opportunity is going to be, why are you a hypocrite, not why are you a believer? Because if we do such audacious things as love our enemies, the world can't help, even though they persecute us, but to ask us, why do you do the things you do? What is your faith? We are to love such good lives among the heathen that even though they persecute us, they can't help but ask, why do you do it? and your good deeds will glorify your Father which is in heaven. He did that until the day, verse 2, that He was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit. Jesus' instructions came through the Holy Spirit. He was prayerfully dependent on God His Father. He was fully man, but yet fully God. He gave it to the apostles that He had chosen, and that's not just the twelve, that's the seventy that followed Him. That's all the people that were true apostles, that were true believers that were blessed. After His suffering... He presented Himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that He was alive so that they would believe that the hope that they have founded on Jesus by fixing their eyes on Jesus, that they knew that they would have resurrection, uh, resurrection power in this world and resurrecting life after this world. That it, So what if people harm you in this world? Fear God who has the power to put your soul in hell, Jesus told us. He appeared to them for a period of 40 days, and He spoke about what? The kingdom of God. Not the kingdom of Israel, not the things of this world, but the kingdom of God. Why? So you will fix your eyes on heaven. So you'll live for the kingdom. So you won't worry about what you <coughs> excuse me, eat or drink or anything else. You'll think about the hope that you have, and you'll fix your life, 
You, the, what you focus on and everything else on the kingdom of God, on heavenly matters. So you won't build up treasures here on earth that will fade away, but you'll build up treasures in heaven. So what was this former book? We've determined who Theophilus is or is not, a friend of God. What was this former book? Of course, it was Luke. So at the beginning of Luke, Luke writes this way as his introduction. Many have taken, this is Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all prophecies, all hopes, all dreams, all promises. Jesus Christ is the one the one that will be used by God to save His people. Just as they were handed down to us by those who were first eyewitnesses and servants of the Word. With this in mind, once I, once, with this in mind since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Why? Verse 4, So that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Luke's gospel is directed to the same audience, whether it's a person or all of us as a friend of God, so that we'll know that all fulfillment came in Jesus Christ. There is no doubt whatsoever. And he writes this gospel message of the life of Jesus with his, with his teachings. He writes them in an orderly account. They're not in a chronological account. So when you read the gospel of Luke, it will speak out to you totally differently than the other gospels will and so forth. And he writes this so that you'll know for certain what you believe is true. Why? So you'll do something with that gift. So you won't put it up on a shelf and not use it and say, here's my Christian get into heaven card free, that you'll use it to go out and love your neighbors and love the Lord and show them the way and do good deeds for others. That's the pattern we're reading in Acts. That's what the apostles did, not just the, the twelve, but, but whoever followed after them. Even unto death, the first martyr was a lay person, correct? And you do this and you continue to do this as the church grows and grows and grows until Jesus comes and claims his bride. <clears throat> the ending of Luke is this way. Luke 24, verse 45 to 53. Then he opened their minds, Jesus, so they could understand the scriptures. That knowledge of the kingdom of the heaven, the secrets that God had, His, His fulfillment, His plan all along have been given to you, but not to them. That's why Jesus spoke in parables. So that you could live a life that glorifies God and you could show others the way. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And Jesus fulfilled all that. Jesus did this. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in His name. That's yours and my job. Not just the first guys. Not just the guys that came after that. It's, Luke is writing this somewhere around A.D. 90 roughly. But everyone who believes, who decides to take up the call that Jesus is their King and Jesus is their Lord. Repentance for forgiveness of sins will be preached in His name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem, and that's what we see kind of in the first 12 chapters of Acts. You are witnesses or martyrs even of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had left them out of the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped Him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. I didn't look it up to see how long it takes to read Luke, but if you read Luke and you read Acts, they're about the same. They're the, little, they're the most words written in the New Testament, even with all the little letters of Paul and everything else. They're a scroll. They're a full scroll. Luke, I'm sure he had to go back and blot out a lot of things. They're a full scroll of information about Jesus Christ and His followers and what they're doing to change this world to bring the kingdom of heaven here on earth. The continued work of Jesus in Acts. Acts 1, again, said in my former book, because this is a continuation, Theophilus, I wrote you about all the things that Jesus began to do. That's why I went back and read you the words from Luke so you can see the continuation of the gospel there. And as you get to the end of Acts, you'll see like, well, wait a minute, it just kind of open-ended. 
It, it has because we're still writing the story of Acts today by what we do, our Acts. The title is Acts of the Apostles. We call it Acts. But really, it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit through ordinary men and women who take up the calling to follow Jesus and let the power of God live through them. And others will see their good deeds and glorify their Father which is in heaven. <clears throat> In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote to you all about the things that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to, to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, verse 4, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, which is at the end of Luke, and it's repeated again in the beginning of Acts, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised. Echoing the words I wrote, read to you at the end of Luke, which you have heard me speak about, Yep, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. What is this that I'm waiting for? What is this that I'm longing for? Where is this power that I'm doing, this conduit that I have to God? The Holy Spirit. Problem is, this is one of the things I say, and I'll continue to say it, is so many Christians know more about Casper the Friendly Ghost than they do God the Holy Ghost. He should be directing. He, God Himself, should be directing your paths as you pray to God, as you seek Him, as you fellowship together with other Christians, as you study and read the words of life, Jesus dwelling among His people, how Jesus lived, what He commanded, and what He's commanded you to do. And you have the power of God living in you is the power of God living through you. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you've heard me speak. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? I'm still focused on worldly things. I still don't get the picture. I'm not focusing my eyes on Jesus who is now in heaven, and my adoption papers are with Him. I am seated with Him now. I'm just living out my life here on earth till that becomes a reality. I'm an ambassador, a foreigner living in this land. Is that how I'm living this life? Are all the things of this world fading away where they don't mean as much as anymore because I'm focusing my eyes on Jesus and living for Him? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father set by His own authority. That ends that statement. It's not about kingdoms here on earth. It's about the kingdom of heaven. But, get this, we totally changed the topic, but whatever you said here, I'm saying this. Go clean your room. Your child says, but. You go right back and say, I said clean your room. <laughs> you shut them up with that but. Here's the but. You will receive power. You can't do anything about being a witness till you realize the power that lives inside of you and you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. In fact, you're not a child of God unless you've been born again by the Spirit. The sad thing is if you're born again but you never grow to live. What child doesn't want to grow up and be like their daddy if their daddy is worth anything? or whatever superhero that they pick, or whatever. Is Jesus who you're fixing your eyes on? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. What will, I, what will happen as a result of that? I will be, I will be, Alan will be a witness. Are you witnessing? Even to the point, like I said, there's irony in it that that word is translated as martyr also. Will I be a witness to death? Will I fear only God and nothing else? Will I live for Him, for the kingdom of heaven? And then that will happen in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, which we read about through the next uh, chapter, chapter 28 to the end of Acts. We see that. And we begin by seeing Peter, because Jesus did say through this fisherman, who is very headstrong and does many things that he probably shouldn't do, and especially opens his mouth before he thinks, We'll see him start the building of the church, of which he prophesied, reads prophecy 
that the fulfillment has come now because all the people are speaking in tongues that believe. All the believers. And they're doing mighty deeds by the power of the Holy Spirit. Not the twelve. Not the seventy. And then you see a bad example in the church in chapter 5. And then you keep reading and you read about lay people so that they could go do the, present the gospel message that pick up the ordinary works of the church. And the first one you read about Stephen is he just gets killed right off for his testimony. You're still breathing. Are you still testifying about Jesus Christ and the great salvation that you have? And then you read about Philip, and if you're into Star Trek and things, I was a Trekkie, he's the first one that ever got beamed anywhere. <laughs> and he didn't say, beam me up, Scotty. He didn't even do anything. He just was put here to there so that he could preach the gospel message. And he didn't even ask why or anything. He just started preaching. Because he couldn't keep his mouth quiet. Because of that great salvation that was in him. If I had a key verse for Acts, I would say it would be Acts 1.8. But forget everything else. You will receive power. I have. And I will be his witness. I know that I'm a child of God because I know that His Spirit dwells with my spirit. And His Spirit guides me and leads me into all truth. I know that it is better than if Jesus was here walking with me in person today. I know that I have a responsibility to live like Jesus in this world and tell others of the hope. So the world gets further and further behind with its desires and temptations and snares so that it's easy to cast them away so that I can run this race with perseverance. Is that where you're at? And I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that should be the procession of a child maturing in Christ. To be like Christ. And the cool thing is we get to the ending here and we see that Christians are first called Christians. Believers are in Antioch of all places. If you don't understand that, that's past Jerusalem, past Judea, past Samaria. It's the ends of the earth at that point. They've hit Asia Minor. They've hit Rome. The, the gospel is being presented to Romans, the ones that hold them in captivity, the kingdom that controls that world. And the gospel has made it to that point, just like Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in these places. <clears throat> I told you I think the title, my title is Acts of the Holy Spirit through people like Alan. I hope you see that. I hope you let the Spirit live through you. That you don't get distracted by the, abbre the abbreviated version or even Acts of the Apostles. Because you are Apostle. You are a disciple. You are a friend of God if you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The key things you need to understand is, is that you, Sherry, I'll use you as an example, have been clothed with power from on high. Sherry, are you waiting eagerly for that gift that the Father promised each and every day? Do you pray He gives you more and more? Because who, would, who wouldn't expect their, heavenly, their earthly Father who gives good gifts for their heavenly Father not to give them more? Jesus says that. He says, be persistent in prayer. Keep asking, even if your persistency is what brings it. And the heavenly, your heavenly Father will give you more of the Holy Spirit. That's what he'll give you of, not things, not money, not power, not even an ability to speak so I can do this. He'll give you the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will give the gifts that he sees. You might first need the timidness, timidness taken away before you can speak. Don't worry, you don't need to know the words to speak. He'll give you the words to speak when the time comes. You need to be the vessel. Sherry, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and we see that all in Acts. Sherry, you will see power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witness. I could have picked anybody's name. I just did that for example there. That's who you are in Christ. Do you realize that and are you living that? <clears throat> Jesus called a fisherman to be a fisher of men and that's what we see in the beginning of Acts. But then Luke quickly changes that over to lay people who serve God with all of their hearts. And if you remember, they're the ones that take the gospel outside of Jerusalem and Judea. They're the ones that continue on. Maybe they needed to be the example for the fishermen 
Peter. I don't know. But God used them to take the next steps. Like I said, the, the, what the first martyr was, was lay, a lay person. And they performed mighty works and deeds and spoke boldly in the name of Jesus Christ. It wasn't something for the twelve. It was, for, it was something. It, the Holy Spirit, He is for everyone who believes with the same power. Not to just seal you as a child, but to give you power to live and to testify the name of Jesus Christ. We'll remind you of some words that Jesus said in John 15, 1 through 17. Because if you're a friend of God, Jesus had some words about friends. In John 15, verse 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, He prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I also will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. So my first question for you, and I'm going back to the title of a good man a little bit, and we'll get to that a little bit more in a minute, is you've got to be in the vine. And you've got to remain in the vine. The problem with that farmer that goes out to seed is some of them hear it with, and accept it with joy but then quickly don't have root and fade away and die. You need to accept that Jesus Christ is the one who covers your sin, that you were wretched, pitiful, naked, and blind, but because you are destitute in your spirit, you have asked for forgiveness of your sins and received the grace of God through Jesus Christ, and you belong to the kingdom of heaven. I'm going back to the Beatitudes from last week. Now you need to remain in the vine. Remain in Jesus. Because Satan's going to do all he can to take you away so that the truth wasn't there or that he distracts you from the truth, whatever it is. Continuing in verse 4, Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit because you will grow and increase. The plant doesn't grow more fruit until it grows in size, in maturity till that harvest comes. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like what? A branch that is thrown away and withers. That means it's dead. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. That's pretty clear. Verse 7, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Because you'll be so focused on what Jesus was focused on that even the cross set before Him was a joy. But it wasn't easy. He prayed to God to take this cup of suffering from Him if He, if he would. But He pray, also prayed, Not my will be done, but yours, Father. It may be hard. It may be impossible. In fact, it will be impossible for man, but it's totally possible with God. For you to do the things that are set before you in the race that's marked out for you. Remain in Jesus and ask for whatever you wish, and the Father will give you more of the Holy Spirit to carry you through whatever it is. Even the words to say when people are stoning you to death like Stephen. Verse 8, This is to my Father's glory that you do bear much food, fruit. What does this do? Show yourselves to be my disciples. This is proof. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. So how can I do that? Verse 10 answers it. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love, being like Jesus, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So what are Jesus' commands? Verse 12 answers that. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Now you can't throw out your enemy there, can you? can't say that this is just brotherly love, that he's just saying this to the disciples so that they'll love each other because Jesus died for his enemies and we in fact were his enemies, but now we're his friends who Luke is writing this to. <clears throat> if you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. I just said that, the joy for the cross, that it don't matter what you suffer. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Now verse 13, 
Greater love has no one than this. What? To lay down one's life for one friend. What does that mean? To give up whatever this earth has to offer and even your life to do it. Stephen, first layperson, first example of that. <clears throat> you are my friends if you do what I, I command. Verse 15, I no longer call you servants or slaves because a slave doesn't know the master's business. You do. You know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. And you've been given all power and authority to live like a kingdom child. Instead, Jesus says it again, I've called you friends. For everything that I, that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not chose, choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you. So that you might, what, go and bear fruit. Pretty clear. If you're in Jesus, you're to bear fruit. And the gardener, the Father, will prune you even more, and that'll be through the Holy Spirit, through the things that you face, the trials, everything else. But the Holy Spirit gives you everything you need to, to do that, to grow to maturity, to bear more fruit. Okay? We've all seen plants grow. It's, it's an easy analogy to, to take and understand. I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, not things that will pass away. And so whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. And if you missed it the first time, this is my command. Love each other. Friends, I told you last week how blessed you were. This is about being a friend, a friend of God who does such good deeds that he's called a good man. <laughs> That's Barnabas, if you hadn't figured that out yet. I love Barnabas. I love Andrew, because he's the one that brought Peter, because he was so excited. He brought Peter. He wasn't worried about being the Peter. He was worried about bringing his brother. Barnabas wasn't worried about being the Paul. He was worried about telling people and supplying their needs and loving them so that the world faded away. And he was called a good man. Wow. Are you a friend of God or an enemy? Are you a slave to this world or a slave to Jesus? You're a freed slave if it's Jesus because it's your choice. But you should give up everything to live for him. Are you in the vine? Are you being nursed by the vine? And are you letting God actually prune you? That's got to hurt so that you'll produce more fruit. Bonnie said something about our trees out in the front the other day. She said, man, those things look healthy. And I said... Yeah, she said, it's because you pruned them well. I said, yeah. <laughs> okay, Sherry did. I just got that clear. Drama queen. <laughs> what is a Christian's life supposed to look like? And how can you live such a life that you'd be called a good man or woman? There's another story that I want to tell you about in just a second, and this involves a real young man that came to Jesus, and he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life or the kingdom of heaven one of the ones the sections that I preach about a lot You're good, you can read it in the gospel of Luke or Mark or Matthew but I want to go to Matthew today each of them the young man comes ask, up and asks Jesus what he must do good teacher or good master to inherit the kingdom of heaven because he expects that he needs to do something with his life the thing is, salvation is a free gift. It's by faith, period. You're born again. But what are you going to do with that gift? See, it's not by works of righteousness you've been saved, but if you've been given a gift, let's say you've been given a gift of a car. If you never drive it anywhere, what good is it? And the gift that the Father promised you is the Holy Spirit so that you could live like Jesus in this world. Which is, oh wow, I cannot even fathom that. But as I let the power of the Holy Spirit drive me along, propel me, it's the gas in the tank, whatever you want to say, then the more He's going to take me there and show me the way and even give me the words to say. But I've got to listen to Him and let Him drive me to wherever that is. Stop saying, my will be done, but your will be done, Lord. I need to be open to, go, to doing what He calls me to do and not make excuses and to... to, to 
to have that hope that these other things don't matter, but what matters is that person put in my path today that needs this, that I do this and tell them about Jesus, and the other things don't matter if it costs me my job or whatever. But I'm focused on kingdom things because no greater love does a man have but to give up his life even for his friend. And isn't that exactly what Jesus did to call me his friend and his brother? But the thing in the, the gospel, and I forgot to put it down here last night because my head hurt. <laughs> the thing about the gospel of Matthew, let me read it to you because that's what I forgot to put the scripture down here. I'm in Matthew 19, verse 16. And this is a man that if anybody looked like he was the one, a lot of people might have called him a good man. Okay? But we don't have that here. He was the one who did all the commandments. He had the things. He used them for God's glory, but his heart wasn't right. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. Because there is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. But we can't do that, can we? Which ones, the man inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not, sh you shall not give false testimony. Okay, each of the other Gospels, Mark and Luke, tell those same things. What were those commands? relational to human beings. Okay, the first commandments are God, keep the Sabbath holy, honor your father and mother, your first relationship to giving your family, your blessing and inheritance from the Lord, your, your family and, and your children, and then how are you going to relate to others? So you get to, to, to number 10, which nailed Paul, thou shalt not covet, because I desire the things of this world, and I want them is why I don't want to help you, and I want to pass pass blame again and judge and say well I'll enable you you don't deserve this okay <laughs> different topic for a different day but Matthews also has after honor your father and mother love your neighbor as yourself the other accounts don't have that but Matthew has that wait a minute the others basically they're part of the ten and you got one, two, three, four, five there. I don't know if you've got them all or not. I didn't go that far. But the love your neighbor is a wrapping it all together. Jesus is clear about that. Sum it up. What's the greatest command? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. All the prophecies, all of the, the writings in the Old Testament speak of this. And if Jesus is a fulfillment of it like... Luke said, then he is the fulfillment of this, how to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Funny thing is, the man said, all of these I've kept. Jesus didn't scorn him or anything else. He said, no, you didn't. You know, what's our first tendency when somebody asks you, I need rent money. But did you drink it away Saturday night? If he tells you yes or no, that, what does it matter? The thing is, is... Will you offer him grace? Jesus didn't say, you know, no, you didn't keep these. He answered, if you want to be perfect, if you want to be complete, you think you're at wherever you're at in this journey. That's your thought process. But your pro thought process is until you're spiritually bankrupt and realize that there's no way you can get to heaven and you thank God and ask him for salvation that only comes through Jesus Christ and you don't get it. You're not born again. And if you are born again, then you can read those other Beatitudes and they'll make a lot more sense to you until you get to this point where you can love your neighbor even as yourself. You can even give up your life to save a friend. Jesus' answer, though, was if you want to be perfect, go sell all your possessions, because that hit this guy, and give them to the poor. No contingencies here. And you will have treasure in heaven. Read the Beatitudes again. Then come and follow me. Then. But the young man went away sad, and even his disciples said, well, who can get to the kingdom of heaven then? But Matthew puts in there that other to even love your neighbors. Barnabas understood this. <laughs> what's one of the first things, well, what's the first thing when you hear about Barnabas? It's in Acts chapter 4, you should remember that. 
where Barnabas sold his property and gave it, put it at the apostles' feet. He didn't give them instructions on how to distribute it. He trusted God, and there were no needy people in the church. And the power of the Lord dwelt among them, and their numbers increased. And they rejoiced and celebrated. Huh, okay. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. I'm not going to keep reading. I want you to go back, but I'm going to go back down to the end of that section after the Beatitudes, verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That's our purpose. And we have the privilege of, along the way, showing people the truth by the, what we profess and by how we live. Acts 9.31 Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, that's where it's grown to, Luke is writing this, this is where it's at now, enjoyed a time of peace. Well, now remember before they were suffering, who were they suffering at the hands of? This guy named Saul, who's single-handedly going to persecute and destroy the church, who now we're going to read about is single-handedly going to build the churches in Asia Minor in the far ends of the earth. Wow, what a story. They enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. How was the church strengthened? Living in the fear of the Lord. Remember that my motto verse in Hebrews 11 where out of holy fear Noah built an ark to save his family. You condemn the world because of your holy fear to God. As a child to a parent, I don't do it because I think my daddy's going to do this to me. I do it because my dad's my authority and I know he loves me, but I know he'll discipline me also. <laughs> Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, letting him prune them, growing, becoming more and more like Christ, being revealed in all truth. It is better for the Holy Spirit to be here than to Jesus to be walking among them. And... The church increased in numbers. This is a fact. This is a historical fact. Is this how the church is living today? And the power, it is clear, is 100% from the Holy Ghost. If you get any of the free Methodist stuff, the light and life now comes via electronic communication. There just happened to be an article in here about Acts 931 empowerment model for this month. And it, um, the guy writes, Pushing my 1969 GTO muscle car down Main Street was an embarrassing irony for me in the 12th grade, for my 12th grade soul. I had the fastest car in town, but it was out of fuel and consequently out of power. In my business, busyness and distraction, I had failed to spend time at the gas station. And it goes on to say, Empowerment happens when the church walks in fear of the Lord, the partnership of the Spirit, and their goal is multiplication. Casting aside any other fear, anything else, to live a life that brings glory and honor to God. So as you read through, you got to Acts chapter 12, or Acts chapter 11, I mean, you'll get to Acts chapter 12 tomorrow, and you saw the church grow all the way to Antioch. Now, if you don't know what that is, okay, this is, I don't have a pen. This is the uh, Mediterranean. Is that what's there in that body? Yeah, Mediterranean Sea. You know, Italy's the boot that sticks down in. And off beside it, there's a little island. That's Cyprus. Still Cyprus today. That's where Barnabas is from. Jerusalem's down here on the coastline, kind of the bottom of that. Of that okay? And then as you go up, you leave Judea, and you go into Samaria. And then you go on up to where, let's see, Paul was on the road to where? Huh? Oh, yeah, Damascus right here. And if you keep going, you go up here, and Antioch's at the top portion of this body of water. So they've gone from the bottom of that body of water to the top portion of water. What's above that? Modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor, where the church of Galatia is, the church of Ephesus is, and so forth and so on. Even the church of, what's that lukewarm one? Laodicea. <laughs> okay. So you see how the gospel is spreading exactly as Jesus said it would. Why? Because there were genuine people who genuinely relied on the Holy Spirit and didn't worry about the things of this world. 
you throw any of those other factors in there, I, my money's my own, my time's my own, uh, I can't do it because I still have a problem, here, then it wouldn't have grown like that, or at least it wouldn't have grown through you. You wouldn't be a Stephen, you certainly wouldn't be a Barnabas who was called a good man. Acts 11, verse 22. News of this, news of what? Of this spreading to Antioch. Reach the church in Jerusalem where Peter and the other apostles were. Because they're there. The lay people are doing all the work going out to there. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw that the great, what the grace of God had done. That's part of the Beatitudes again. It's only by God's grace that he's reaching us and especially reaching the rest of the world. He was glad. He was encouraged. That's a word that's directly related back to the Holy Spirit. And he, uh, he encouraged them to remain true to the Lord, to remain in the vine with all their hearts. He was a good man. I didn't write the sermon until late last night after bumping my head. But I studied all week. I contemplated on that good man and everything else and what that meant. And then it would bring me to this scripture and that scripture. And the Holy Spirit would speak to me and I would pray to God, I want to be a good man. I want all of you to be good men and women. I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. I want to be fruitful and pass on that fruit, that life to others. I want to be a spring of living water. There's nothing that matters more. I need to get those other distractions out of the way. I need to realize that each and every day. And it helps to have companions along the way. Luke writing for Paul while he's in prison. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. If you read, you realize that was also said about Stephen, that he was full of the Holy Spirit when he was brutally killed for feeding the poor and saying it was in Jesus' day. Barnabas was a man full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Faith that saved him, faith that grew from mustard, childlike faith. Oh, each of those accounts of that rich man, the, what's prior to it is where Jesus brings the little kids to him and says, kingdom of heaven is for such as these. And he even says that if you don't accept the kingdom of heaven like a child, you will never enter it. And he takes them in his hands, he prays for them, and he blesses them. That childlike faith that my Father in heaven will take care of me. I am a child of God. Nothing can harm me. He lives inside of me and He's given me a job to do. He was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith. <laughs> and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Isn't that what you want? Don't you want your children saved? Don't you want even your enemies saved? If you read the words before that, you would have also caught, Now those who had been scattered by persecution that broke out when Stephen, <laughs> I, I told you all this, but there it is in the previous words, was, uh, was killed, traveled to Phoenicia, Cyprus, the home of Barnabas, and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. Some of them, however, these lay people again, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also. If you also read this week, you'll see where the Holy Spirit had to give uh, Peter a vision or dream to not be so hypocritical and judgmental against the Greeks, but to go to Cornelius. And you'll see that the Holy Spirit came again upon people, upon the Greeks, uh, at the house of Cornelius. They went to the Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. Verse 21, The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. And then you read that again in verse 24, Barnabas, he was a good man full of Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. This continuation because of godly men and women, not the twelve, that were doing what they were called to do by the power of the Holy Spirit and their faith, and the numbers increased. Here's the accounts so far of Barnabas. You're going to have more. Acts 4, 4, 36. His real name's Joseph. A Levite, 
part of the tribe of Levi, look at all these things, from the island of Cyprus, whom the apostles, that would be the twelve, called Barnabas. Why do they call him Barnabas? Well, his real name, Joseph, means, I think, anointed, picked by Jehovah, maybe. Do you know right off? It's anointed or picked by Jehovah God. And then they changed, they surnamed him, that's what the word is, changed his name. They called him, because he was so much this, Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, which is a form of the same word that Jesus gave when he said, I will send the paraclete. That word that used there is paraclesis. This guy, not one of the twelve, was so encouraging to the twelve because he lived like Jesus and was so full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Wow. What did he do? Verse 37, he sold a field that he owned and bought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. And I told you the rest. The next time you see his name is Acts 9, 26, our scripture. When Paul came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. What did it take? Barnabas. But Barnabas took him, this is to the twelve again, and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul was on his journey and seen the Lord, and the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. Then in Acts 11, you read Barnabas again. News of the Greeks being saved in Antioch reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent who? Not one of the twelve. Barnabas. And what does Barnabas do? Sets the way for Paul to spread the gospel the rest of the way. Wow! Exactly what Jesus commissioned, what he said would happen, happened. Is it happening in the church and in your life today? I told you, I, I want to be a good man. I don't know if I'll ever hear it. I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. I don't know if you'll say it, if my enemies will say it, but I want to know that I'm full of faith. I want to know that the things of this world don't matter to me. I want to know that I'm full of the Holy Spirit, and I want to see fruition in my life and people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And the rest of the world can just fade away <coughs> till I meet Jesus face to face. Is that what you want for your life? You are blessed. You are holy. You are righteous. You are set apart. You are a kingdom of priests. You have been saved from God's wrath if you believe in Jesus Christ. What are you going to do with the gift that has been given to you? Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for the precious, precious gift of Jesus Christ this great and amazing salvation that you have given to us. Lord, that Jesus would come and humbly come to earth and lay down his life to save such a sinner as I. Oh God, you are so gracious, so kind. How can I ever think of myself more highly than I ought to? How can I not lay down my life as a willing sacrifice? Oh God, I need your help. I need your church's help to play their part. Lord, we need one another. We need the gifts that the Spirit gives us to comfort and to, to guide, to rejoice and to praise, Lord. Lord, help your church to be obedient and found spotless the day when Jesus comes. Thank you for this church, for this body, Lord. Thank you for our fellowship. Fill this church with your Spirit. Fill this church with your faith. In Jesus' name, amen.